Okay. Good afternoon. Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski, and today we are going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists. Today we're going to be looking at this famous painting called, or dubbed the Talisman. Uh, its actual original title is Le Bois d'Amour à Pont Avant um, from 1888 by Paul Cerisier, and uh, this is, it's a really important painting in the history of modern art, because it's really one of the first pictures to have this type of flat uh, color, and to be kind of prefiguring uh, abstraction, essentially. And, uh, and, you know, it's beyond that, the colors are, are really quite beautiful. So I'm really excited to paint this painting. It's actually quite small. It's a relatively tiny little painting here. Uh, not too much, well, that's probably maybe even a little bit smaller than the canvas that we paint on, to be quite honest. So let's look at the plan for today. We're going to uh, get the image onto the canvas. I'll show you how to do that. Uh, then we're going to stain it with some color. We'll talk about Cerisier's biography. And uh, probably don't need to do any underpainting. I don't think there is any anyway. So we'll start working on the foreground, background. And there is a foreground and a background on, on here. Although it there is a certain level of flatness to this painting, which we'll talk about. So potentially we can kind of blur the, the boundaries between foreground and background. Uh, there's um, a few ways you could support the channel so that I continue doing this kind of thing. You can like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Roughly 80% of the people that watch the videos on my channel are not subscribers, so I might have something like 10,000 views per week, roughly, and then about a 100, 150 people will um, uh, will will subscribe to the channel. So. You know, if more and more people subscribe, that would be a game changer for me. And I could do this once a day, twice a day or, or so. That would be awesome. So if you also want to support the channel with a small donation, you can use PayPal. That's your best as well as using an e-transfer through email um, or a check in the mail or, you know, a donation of Ferraris, uh, plural. <laughs> Contact me through my email. My email's on the Facebook group and my website. Both links are down below. Uh, you can use the YouTube Super Chat during the live streams, but YouTube takes like 40% of what you donate. So uh, your best bets are PayPal or e-transfer. Um, so, and thank you to those of you who've been supporting the channel for years now. I really do appreciate um, everything this whole thing is happening because of you guys. So thank you so very much once again. Okay, so let's get started into this whole process here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with the image transfer. We're gonna get an image onto the canvas. Now this painting is, again, relatively straightforward, um, but it might be helpful to have some uh, waypoints to to get started so you're not focused so much on the drawing and more just on the painting now of course you could take my free drawing course here on YouTube uh, here's a quick shout out to the Facebook group here some amazing new stuff on there join the Facebook group and upload your work to the Facebook group so that uh, I think in maybe the next week or the week after we're doing a free feedback episode where I go through everything on there and give free advice on how to improve your work. Often I'm just celebrating great achievements because you guys are doing such great jobs. Okay, so if you click on the link down below for the Dropbox folder, you'll see um, the, the top here is basic resources to get started, including lists of paints and all that kind of stuff and uh, color wheel templates. And then the templates for all the, the paintings that we have done subsequently begin here. We have our more simple paintings that begin with letters, and then the ones down below that begin with numbers. These are more complex, and you can see that there are hundreds of folders in here um, from artists from all over the world throughout history 
And um, so, but here we are. This uh, 00Z33, <laughs> Paul Saberzier. Uh, so we click in here, and then you'll see that uh, we've got three files, the original image, plus two tracings. They're identical, one's just a, a JPEG, one's a PDF. So you can print those out on your printer at home, and then we can do an e-transfer, e an image transfer. Uh, okay, I was dealing with terrible computer problems before we got started here, and you may have even noticed as soon as I went live, the computer crashed, which meant that I also not only had to reboot the computer, but but get all of my um, all the tabs and get re totally restart as I had just started. Anyway, so that kind of has discombobulated me and and thrown me for a loop. So what we're gonna, we've now printed off this, maybe I actually didn't even show the template here. Let me just show. So there's the original image, and then there's the template that you can find in the Dropbox folder. And then we can print it out on your, on regular photocopy paper, on your inkjet, laser jet printer at home or at work. Um, just make sure the boss is at lunch when you do any printing at work. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to take this print and I'm going to transfer it onto this 9 by 12 sized canvas panel. And so usually these canvas panels, you'd buy them at the dollar store. This one I bought on Amazon and the link is below for this specific one. You know, you, you I think they come in a set of 12 for 24 bucks Canadian, so probably like 18 bucks American, which make them about, you know, buck 50 to $2, $2.50 per canvas, as opposed to $1 per canvas. And I think they're certainly twice as good, maybe three or four times as good as the ones at the dollar store. But I began these whole series of paintings almost four years ago using canvases from the dollar store for about a year, right? So the ones in the dollar store aren't bad. They're just, you know, probably not going to last 100 plus years, right? Long after we're dead, so that's going to be somebody else's problem. Anyway, I take it out of the plastic. I give it a light sanding and then I apply some white acrylic gesso across the surface and then I sand it again with some 100 grit sandpaper. It gets me a nice smooth surface. And the reason why I keep flipping this back onto the other side is I'm just showing here's the drips from that gesso. So I, you know, I often have, I apply the gesso and then I just put it on a couple things so that it's kind of raised off the ground and then the paint kind of drips off the edges. That way the paint's not dripping onto some new, I mean, it does drip onto newspaper. There's usually newspaper underneath, but it just makes it easier. I don't have to kind of peel paper off the back and um, sometimes it can leave little ridges as it sticks to things. So anyway, long story short, and I'm sure regular viewers are like, I hear some long stories, but uh, not very often are they short. They're long stories long. <laughs> I can't help myself. Okay. Next, I'm going to take some carbon paper, or actually this is graphite paper. And oh, here's some two-sided uh, carbon paper. I think this actually is carbon paper which is going to be exactly the same. It does It's not exactly the same material, but it does virtually the exact same thing. So, you know, I've done a lot of lines on here. So I'm going to bring up the original just so I can see, you know, how, if we actually need to transfer all of these lines. I want to get kind of the, the main ones in here. All right, so here's this where that blue is going to go. Here's this yellow. <laughs> so, you know, this is if you know, anyone can do one of these image transfers. I just, I've, I did this on my iPad Pro using the Procreate app. 
And if all of us did our own transfers, we'd probably see that we'd all decide to do focus on different aspects of these paintings. So here's like the shoreline. There's an interesting story about how this painting was made as well that I was totally unaware of until putting together today's episode. So, again, this doesn't have to be super accurate. I'll just lift this up. You can see I'm painting or I'm drawing relatively light because. We're going to be putting color all over this and potentially leaving little gaps in between some of these colors. So I want to kind of do a goal is kind of tread as gently as, well, not as gently as possible, but maybe gentler than some of the other artworks I do. Uh, you can also see that this is double-sided carbon paper, so those lines are going on to both sides of the canvas and onto the paper. So in this instance, it doesn't matter which side is up or down because they're both up and down. Okay, I think that's probably good enough. So let's just peel this off. Lots of comments in the chat there. try to catch some of these. Okay, so there's Kathy and Pascaline is just a quick hello before I close my eyes and go to sleep. And there's Goodman. Um, and Pascal. Where are we here? Goodman says, well, I don't have the tools, but I'm going to try to do this in pencil and color. That would be cool. Goodman says, hello, Mr. Markowski. How was your day? My day's been, oh, pretty good. Yeah, I got to hang out with my daughter this morning before we went to school. She was up a little bit late last night, so we were late to school because I let her sleep in a little bit so she wouldn't be cranky. <laughs> Pascal says graphite is made of carbon atoms, so technically it's still carbon. <laughs> uh, Barbara says just a quick hello for me before I head to bed. That last marathon paint along nearly killed me. <laughs> yeah, today is not going to be an 8 hour or 12 hour episode. Although I should probably not say that because somehow I'll manage to overcomplicate things and I will be here till sunrise again oh my goodness oh and there's Lisa hello Lisa okay so let's let's get to the next step going on here now that we've got our image transferred onto the canvas let's put some color over top of it and that this first step is what we call the imprimatura, or the priming layer. And so we want to put some paint on there to get it started. And, um, uh, and that color is going to imbue the other colors over top of it with a little bit of a warm, sunny glow. At least that's the way I like to do it. So let's talk about the paint that we're going to use while we're at it. So, I like to use this method called the split primary palette. That means we take our so-called three primary colors and we split each of them in half into their warm and cool components because every color has a temperature. If that's too confusing for you, you can think of warm colors, uh, as, as I use them here, have a kind of an orange, they literally have orange-like pigments inside, even if they're not necessarily a, 
apparent maybe to a beginner painter and your cool colors have a kind of a greenish quality to them and so when we combine those like warm colors together we get a really warm color and when we combine cool colors together we get a really cool color together and they'll be more saturated than if we mix warm and cool colors together in fact we can mix our own black by mixing warm and cool colors together so i you know you can buy a tube of black paint but you certainly don't need to because you know i've got a couple of tubes of black paint i bought here almost four years ago that i still haven't completely used up so um, the, to get started, I'm going to use this Amsterdam brand of paint. I've been using this paint for the past four years. And it does everything I need it to do. And it's the good thing, too, is it's, it's cheap or relatively cheap. It's, I think it's your best bang for the buck in terms of uh, paint and quality. It's, you can certainly spend more money on acrylic paint. But uh, um, you're probably not going to notice much of a difference. Now, I'm just going to flip through all of these other paints by all these different paint companies. All of this is in one of the handouts listed there uh, in the Dropbox folder. So uh, I'm not going to spend too long kind of uh, talking about all of this. Having said that, there are a few colors, brands here. Like Museum Color. And Peebo that add way too much titanium white to their paint. So like every paint has titanium white in it, or, or most brands do, but some put too much in there and it makes it impossible to mix a black as I like to do. So you can use any of those colors, uh, that, any of those color sets that I've just pointed out there to get very similar results to, to me. I know somebody uh, sent me a message saying, you know, I'm in Brazil, and the price of these paints is outrageous. Well, I'm sure even in Brazil, there are brands of paint that are less expensive, and and you should be able to find some of the ones that I posted here. And if, if not, send me some pictures of your local art supply store, the paints there, and I can help you choose the colors that I would select if I was there with you in Brazil. All right. So unless somebody wants to send me a plane ticket to come down to Brazil, which would be amazing, <laughs> that's the best, as best as I can do. But I'm, I guarantee you that there's something there that you can use. Okay. Because you, you shouldn't need to spend a lot of money on paint to get started, at, at least. Yes, as you progress, you may want to consider investing in more expensive paint. <laughs> Got some new neighbors that just moved in.
I was looking at this painting earlier, and it looks like there is a color not too dissimilar from this as the Impre Matura, so that's always good to see. So that people don't think I'm too crazy. Because this uh, yellow Impre Matura is definitely uh, my own kind of concoction. Traditionally, artists would use a um, kind of a brick red kind of color as opposed to this warm yellow. But as I've shown many times that the brown at the very end, you, if you have two paintings, one with the warm yellow and one with brown, you can see that there's a difference, but most people, unless you, there were side by side and you could compare them directly, would not notice the difference at all. So this just helps get the painting started real quick. We don't have to do any mixing to get our priming layer down. Now, of course, you could go buy a tube of brown paint and skip that step altogether. But notice how I don't have any brown paint, right? I don't, uh, um, I, I want to keep my palette as simple as humanly possible. So, um, Barbara says, Oh, this is going to be a lovely painting. My goodness, is my country the tools of painting is a little bit expensive. <laughs> Pascal says, worst case scenario, if no paint, you could smash rock roots, insects down to powder, and add egg white. <laughs> well, you know, I was actually going to say the same thing earlier, in that, um, you know, for the vast uh, majority of human history, artists made their own paint. And most of it was, I mean, it had to be mostly just stuff that was nearby that was available to you before, you know, trade was as, as big as it was. So artists would have to be very kind of crafty at finding materials in their community and neighborhood that they can use to, to create their own colors. And often that is one reason why certain paintings from certain cultures look the way they do is because they're dependent on the available pigments. <laughs> Goodness says, uh, six colors cost 10 to $15. How much there? Uh, well, so for, you know, a tube of paint like this costs about $17 Canadian, which is about maybe $14 American. But this is a 250 milliliter tube of paint. I, um, I don't have any smaller ones here with me by this brand. But, um, you know, you could... You know, so maybe that sounds like a lot of money. Like, okay, so if I get all of these tubes together, we're talking about $120 or something of paint. But it will it takes me about me, and I'm making a painting maybe once or twice a week, sometimes three times a week. And it takes me about five months to go through one of these tubes of paint. So, you know, when you do the math, you're talking about making like 40 paintings over a sh period of time. And I can use, you know, these six tubes, seven tubes of paint, which cost me 120 bucks. So 40 paintings divided by 120 bucks Canadian. So it'd be about $100 American. You know, how, what does that come out to? Uh, let's do the math. Um... Got a hundred and uh, twenty bucks divided by forty paintings, roughly equals about three dollars of paint per painting. So, and then you have a canvas that is a dollar to five dollars, depending on or, you know how much you spend on your your painting. Uh, so we're talking about basically five dollars in total. Uh, materials for 
40 paintings. And then let's say you were to make paintings that you really liked and you wanted to sell, you know, you could probably sell one of these paintings for somewhere between 40 to $200 each, depending on your skill level and, and uh, the generosity of your, your collector, right? And so immediately that's going to pay for a substantial amount of the paint. Um, and, you know, if you were to sell one of these paintings for 100 150 bucks, well, then you just covered your materials for the next 39 paintings. Right, so, you know, again, that's so, you know, 100, 120 bucks might sound like a lot of money up front, but when you break it down, it's basically the price of a cup of coffee, right? So, or a pack of chewing gum. I went to the 7 uh, Eleven yesterday and bought a pack of chewing gum, and it came out to 249 Canadian plus tax. And I had to, I was like, what? No, no, I just, just the bubble gum. Like oh yeah no that's because it was like two seventy five or I'm like I'm like oh yeah the guy's like yeah bubble gum or chewing gum it was just like regular chewing gum really expensive and I'm like this is like at seventy five cents at the dollar store so don't buy your chewing gum at at seven uh, eleven okay <laughs> uh, um saying says I got these paints on Amazon for 30 pounds or six tubes. So 30 pounds is what, 60 bucks Canadian, maybe $50 American. So that's why I say you gotta look around for, for the price of these paints because you can find them like on, on I, well, I'm glad that Senga found them good on cheap on Amazon, but I have found often Amazon can be sometimes more expensive than your local art supply store. So you should be able to, and especially if you get the, the half size, the 120 milliliter things here, I've seen them for like eight, nine dollars Canadian, which means they should be somewhere around like six dollars each American, you know, so yeah, you should be able to find them uh, relatively inexpensively. <laughs> okay, let's say I should move on here. Now that we've got our canvas uh, primed and ready to go, let's just take a little bit of a moment to talk about who Paul Cerezier was while the canvas dries. So, um, Paul Cerezier was born in Paris in 1864 and dies at age 62 in 1927. And you know, 62 is kind of on the maybe younger side of things. Uh, we've seen some artists die in their late 20s, early 30s, and we've seen some live until their 80s and 90s. So Cerizier is, you know, maybe on the little bit longer lifespan, but certainly would have been nice if he had lived just a little bit longer because, um, although there could be, well, I mean, I'm sure everyone should live as long as possible, but some people are less fans of his later work than his early groundbreaking work here. So, um, uh, Cerizier is, um, he, uh, his father, uh, where... So here's, there's not a lot of information in the Wikipedia entry, but uh, Serzia's father was a business person and was not interested in his son's interest in becoming an artist because Serzia had a passion for art at a young age, was into drawing and painting, but the father was not encouraging of this behavior. Uh, so tried to get him to kind of follow a more practical um, direction in life and set him up with various different uh, kind of business opportunities or or you know mentorship opportunities in business etc but um, he both failed at them and didn't take them and instead pursued his own interests 
So when he was old enough, when he was a teenager, he had, he attended uh, the Académie Julienne, which um, we've talked about a number of times. Like this, this little school in Paris, which is a private art school, was, um, you know, where many French and international artists came to study. It had a pretty good reputation for being um, a little bit more flexible when it came to the kind of art that they were teaching. Because besides the Academy Julien, you had artists who would, were going to uh, L'Ecole des Beaux-Arts, which was much more traditional and academic in its um, uh, instruction. So kind of artists who wanted to, to have a little bit more, many artists who became part of the avant-garde at some point studied at L'Academy Julien. Um, and so it's also at that art school where uh, Paul Serrazier meets a few other artists who become important in the story that we're about to talk about today, which was uh, Maurice Denis and Emile Bernard. And uh, Denis and Bernard were uh, later become important figures in the Les Nabi movement, or the Nabi movement, uh, which we'll talk about here shortly. Um, so it's at that school where he meets the artists that are like-minded, who are going to be some of the, the most important artists throughout the course of his life. Um, it's also, so, you know, here, so he starts school in 1885, and so he's, what, uh, 20 years old, you know, maybe 21, 20 years old, when he starts school at L'Académie Julienne in Paris, where he meets uh, his contemporaries. And at this specific time, you have the Impressionist art movement is now the, the has taken over the art world in Paris, right? So, you know, we've talked about with a number of Impressionist painters in the past, how, um, how Impressionism really kind of was really struggled at first to, to get going and um, it was ridiculed by the Academy and then within a, a, about a decade and a half so Impressionism really starts in the early mid 1870s and lasts maybe arguably until 1890 or so so you have kind of this 20 year or so period of Impressionism. And at the time that Denis and Bernard and Cerisier are at uh, the Académie Julienne, uh, Impressionism is now at the top of the world, right? It's gone from being the, the, the you know, the underground revolutionary art movement to now being the art movement that is the uh, the new academy, right? That's the one that the, the teachers are teaching in school now. And so you've got this younger generation of artists that also want to be rebellious. And now they have to find their own way to rebel against the previous generation's rebellion, right? This tends to be how art history works. It kind of goes from one side to the other side to the other side. Everyone sort of reacting against their teachers. And so we see like some of these early paintings by Sorisier and you know a lot of these early works are they're kind of dark colored they're um, uh, almost like it reminds me a lot of like early Van Gogh paintings like the potato eaters when we which a painting we did a couple of years ago which turned out really great I think um, and so partly these these paintings have a little bit of academic qualities to them um, and academic painting tended to be a lot of much more darker tones uh, as opposed to impressionism which was much brighter colors in fact sometimes didn't even have black at all so we're seeing Cerisier is incorporating both some ideas from impressionism like the speed of the brush strokes the kind of um, slightly less defined figures and spaces um, and really focusing on 
what the Impressionist were was all about light. And he's also using this kind of, so he's using this darker palette to kind of paint in an Impressionist style, I guess would be the, the short way of putting that. So, you know, he's trying to find his own way here. He's probably like, okay, I don't want to just be an Impressionist because that's sort of like my dad's generation and I don't really get along with my dad. So maybe I'm going to look at what my grandfathers w were doing and they were kind of painting in this darker style. But I'm going to take a little bit of what my dad's generation is doing and let's see if I could figure something out there. And I think he pretty quickly realizes both of those options are kind of dead ends for him. I'm not saying there's not potential there for anybody else, but I think he gets in that direction. And he, I think he, he sees there's kind of a limited, yeah, he, there's that, that kind of going off in this direction of looking into the past is not working. So a figure sort of emerges uh, around this same time that that uh, becomes very fascinating to this younger generation of artists, and that is Paul Gauguin. So Paul Gauguin is considered to be sort of like maybe the preeminent post-Impressionist painter. Um, so you have Impressionism followed by post-Impressionism. And Paul Gauguin along with, I guess you could say, uh, Vincent van Gogh and Paul Cezanne would probably be the three, the trifecta of post-Impressionist painters. Um, and of a, a bit of an older generation as well. So I would make the comparison to, this is a bit of a tangent, but the first thing that comes to mind is Paul Gauguin would be like the Robert Rauschenberg or Jasper Johns who kind of helped initiate the, the change from abstract expressionism into pop art, these sort of transitionary figures, because after Rauschenberg and Johns, you have Andy Warhol, right, and pop art. So anyway, um, so what ends up happening is um, you have this young artist who studies in Paris with his friends, and they start going on these trips out west to Brittany. And so I don't know if I've talked about Brittany in any of these episodes. So Brittany is this area in northwest France that um, kind of also has its a little bit of its own unique culture. Uh, it's, um, you know, and it's, it's also relatively isolated. You know, it's not like, you know, if you go down to southern France, then you're, you, you start kind of um, getting influences from Spanish and maybe even Portuguese culture. Or if you go down here, then you've, you're sort of bordering with Italy and Switzerland or the Northeast. There's Netherlands and Germany. Brittany is kind of a bit of its own unique place. Like, you know, like here in Canada, it's maybe like our Newfoundland kind of thing, right? Something where the culture is the similar, but it's also very distinct and unique. Um, and it's in this area... At Pont Aven, kind of right here on the coast, where um, uh, Paul Gauguin has kind of set up a, a bit of a like an artist colony in this little village right here. So Paul Gauguin has, is kind of doing some kind of these summer trips out here, spending time mentoring young artists and um, that's where Cerizier finds himself in 1888 and am I going to be able to find I think it might be Okay, so here's this um, kind of the story that Cerizier um, recounts to his friend Maurice Denis. Uh, so he says that um, Cerizier and Gauguin were walking uh, with, 
walking to and within the Bois d'Amour. So I'll just sort of show you here. So here's, again, there's this, I'll zoom right back out. Here's Brittany in the northwest coast of uh, France. We zoom right in here. So here's kind of the town. And then there's this area, the Bois d'Amour, which is like the, the, the love forest, I guess you might say, is what that might, would probably be roughly translated into. And so it's this beautiful kind of lush river with this kind of trickling little river going through the forests. You know, these old little cabins. Right, you see lots of people probably picking mushrooms up there. Beautiful, picturesque kind of place, right? A great place for artists to come and spend uh, summer and maybe even winter too, right? You could imagine it being relatively quiet and isolated. Not a lot of uh, other artists coming to this neighborhood. So, you know, if you really wanted to get away from Paris, instead of going east or south, where, you know, it's, you know, there's definitely places where it can be very quiet. Here you're kind of going to the edge uh, where you're you're kind of off on your own and you can really spend the entire summer just kind of with your friends painting every day and so they uh, so Gauguin and Cerisier they're walking through the forest and um, Gauguin says to, to Cerisier um, how do you see these trees they're yellow so put some yellow this shadow it's rather blue Paint it with pure ultramarine blue. And those red leaves put vermilion. So the result was a painting with pure and flat colors, which represented not a representation of the scene, but the visual sensations of the painter. So what Gauguin is trying to encourage uh, Sorizier to do is to like be really bold with the colors. And not to be like, okay, well, I see, you know, like he's saying in this shadow, I'll just put a little bit of, tiny bit of blue, but it'll mostly be black. And Gauguin is like, just squeeze that blue right out of the tube and put it there, right? Just be bold with your colors. Be really expressive with your colors. You know, it's and he's, he's not saying, like, don't paint things that aren't there, but dial it up, max it out. Like, don't hold back. And... You know, um, like, so, because other artists might kind of just be very, very subtle with some of those, you know, and the Impressionists would be too, right? But here it's like being, taking those colors, all, in some cases, right out of the, the tube and being very expressive with them. Uh, so quickly, this painting, um, which becomes uh, sort of uh, coined as the talisman here becomes, uh, you know, kind of the symbol of this young group of artists that have kind of found themselves surrounding Gauguin. So Gauguin is kind of this bit of a murky figure. He kind of drifts in and out, uh, out of the, the art community in Paris and France, and also out of the lives of his family, because soon he has left to Tahiti, for an extended period of time, leaving his wife and children there by themselves, right? So, um, uh, and I think, so he's kind of this enigmatic figure that these, you know, he's about t almost, you know, like 16, 17 years older than Cerisier. So he's seen as sort of like the, kind of the elder statesman uh, that is kind of hanging around, showing them the ropes. You know, all these guys are in their early 20s at this time. Maybe 20... So he, he would be 24, I think, when he painted the talisman. Right, so... Um, you know, some of the other friends and students, when they come back to Paris, are just like, that's crazy, dude. You should burn that. That's terrible. But his friends, like Maurice Denis... Uh, and later Pierre Bonnard. We've done a couple episodes on Pierre Bo four, three episodes on Pierre Bonnard, right? 
Pierre Bonnard being probably the most famous person associated with the Les Nabis movement. So that group of artists, you know, they're, they see this painting as kind of a bit of a breakthrough, as a, as a, um, as a completely new way of painting. And maybe it's just worth just taking a quick look at Gauguin's own artwork. And let's, we have three Gauguin uh, paintings coming up soon. Um, but these works that Gauguin is making roughly around this same period. So, you know, this, the talisman that we're painting today is painted in 1888. Here's what Gauguin is making roughly at that same time. And so what we see here is this is very strong, contrasting colors. Uh, very little modeling of the forms. So modeling is what people might call like shading. Right, going from light to dark. Here we have mostly just like bright colors side by side. You know, there's a little bit of modification of those colors, but a lot of flat color. And um, so you see, these are paintings that are made just before that painting. Some of those are from his first trip to Tahiti. And you can see here's a few years later on, here's Gauguin really sort of continuing to just plow ahead with these really bright, saturated colors. The brush strokes, there's no attempt whatsoever to create illusionistic um, spaces or photographic type of images. There, we see all the brush strokes. They're all made very, very visible. And so one of the terms that was, that was arrived to describe this original type of work uh, was Cloisonism, or, or, which is basically named after uh, cloisonné, which is, you know, when you're doing stained glass windows, you're taking this, like, these metal pieces and bending them into shapes and soldering them together, and then pouring kind of liquid, like, like glass, into these different partitions, which hardens. The metal keeps the glass from shattering maybe as easily. Um, and so it has that really distinctive stained glass look. Uh, so um, that becomes kind of the, one of the early terms to describe Gauguin's work. And so we see, you know, these, you know, this also reminds me a little bit of, um, of Edvard Munch and some of the artists um, around Munch and in like Oslo and, and environs, right? Uh, you know, this very unnatural sort of landscape. This also looks, reminds me of some Kandinsky paintings being made at the same time. You have a lot of artists arriving in the same area who are totally unaware of what other people are doing um, because they're kind of reacting against these dominant art movements that are happening around. They're trying to think like, how do I carve my own space um, in the world when impressionism, for instance, is the dominant method at the time? All right, so there's, with with all of these movements, because we'll see here the sort of another way of describing the, um, this type of work is synthetism, which is like a, this is the synthesis of a number of different ideas. Um, mainly being kind of, you know, taking what you see, blending it or synthesizing it with how you feel about what you see, and then um, adding your own kind of style to it, right? You're synthesizing both kind of like what you see with your emotions and your own kind of very subjective interpretation of all of those things. Uh, and that also is very similar to another much larger movement, which was symbolism. And symbolism arguably is, is uh, or at least certainly began as a, 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 a movement within literature. Uh, and so within symbolism, you have, who would be some of the great symbolist artists like... Um, Edgar Allan Poe, 
Um, I'm sure there's uh, like a lot of those French Rambo and um, Beau, uh, Baudelaire. Oh yeah, here we have right up here at the top, right Baudelaire, right here. So let me just uh, since I just brought this up. Verlaine, Mallarmé. Um, essentially, the idea is is that everything means something, right? Every word. It's not just the 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 straightforward description of what you see. It's more like how what you see is emotionally, uh, intellectually impacting you how how the world around you is making you feel right it's a very subjective approach to uh, the world around you and so that also happens in painting so symbolist painting you know can vary quite um quite dramatically here like gustav moreau who i don't think i have him scheduled for this year for next year though um you know, Gustav Moreau is a great symbolist artist because you could see like everything is just full of all these quirky, eccentric kinds of images that all have some sort of meaning to the artist, but maybe not necessarily readily interpretable by the viewer. So when I think of like symbolism, symbolist art, it's like. What is it like? It's like your your you're walking down the street and you see a group of people all dressed up in some sort of you know it's, it could be the middle of June and they look like they're walking around in Halloween costumes and you're like I wonder what I wonder what these guys are doing like what do they think they're they're up to and you almost you want to ask them a question like is there a convention or like what what's is there a party or wh where what's what's the deal right so that that a bit of kind of confusion is i think and the it's like an inside joke in a way you know like uh you you kind of see it in your and, and it creates a bit of a mystery in the viewer where you know there's something going on there's but you're not necessarily, you can't put your finger on it. So, um, what's another analogy? Another analogy might be like the, like secret societies, right? You know, like the Freemasons, right? If you've ever been in a Freemason hall, I've, I've been in Freemason halls, not as a Freemason or as a guest, but just some of the times i've been like when i was up in dawson city in the yukon you can go and walk around inside because there's not a, they don't really do ceremonies in there so they've been it's been preserved and you see that there's all these weird things on the walls and, and instruments that are used for rituals but you don't really know what they're for and probably if you were to ask they would probably tell you i can't tell you all right so um, a lot of this, you could also see how symbolism or symbolist art really prefigures surrealism, which really takes a lot of these ideas that have been percolating for a while and just makes it the, you know, just goes wild with it, right? Where you're just like, there's something really weird and strange. And other things that the symbolists were really into were was like the occult, uh, pagan imagery and and literature um, in um, definitely secret societies and literally that's what the um, the Le Nabi movement was sort of like a pseudo secret society so all of this kind of there's just this weirdness to the to the art to the literature you know, it gives you this sense of uncanny, something kind of creepy and strange and weird. Um, even sort of like, like there's a bit of like an interest in horror. 
Like I, you could probably guarantee, I could guarantee you, if like this the Le Nabi movement was around today, they'd all be big fans of horror movies because horror movies also have like these are, are very strange and surreal, and there's you know the story behind how these ghosts and monsters live, and you know what the you know how how you kill a vampire or a werewolf. You know you need special things like garlic or you need silver bullets, all this kind of weird, um, super specific rules and things that exist. And so all these artists are kind of creating their own bizarre worlds and spaces that all have their own unique rules um, and symbols, right? Everything has this, uh, you know, greater meaning than what we just see, that the, the, the world in front of us is kind of an illusion and our goal as an artist is to pierce through it and see what's really there. Uh, yeah, like Pascal says, Magritte, Dali, full of symbolism. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so you can see there's like all of these different kind of movements that kind of start kind of occurring around the same time and including many of these same artists. They kind of move through things and when eventually Gauguin kind of finally kind of leaves the, the the as the figurehead of this school at Pont Avant uh these artists kind of figure okay well kind of like the our main mentor has taken off to go be with underage girls in Tahiti <laughs> kind of a bit of a creepy well it's very creepy um so what are we going to do? Like we've kind of, he's been kind of leading us down these paths of these different movements that we're sort of starting and then abandoning. <laughs> what should, we, what should we do? And they decide to call themselves the Nabi or, uh, which means essentially, uh, in Hebrew, uh, uh, Nabi means prophet, right? So, and again, they liked that idea that it was from a different language that I'm sure none of them spoke. I don't think any of them spoke Hebrew at all. But they liked that it was kind of mysterious and maybe not a word that anybody else would be able to understand. Except maybe other artists and maybe someone who was Hebrew that they ran to. Like, why are you using that name? Like, do you guys speak any Hebrew? Oh, no, no, we just like how it kind of sounds mysterious and different so uh this the painting the talisman becomes the, the basically the de facto symbol of the this new Le Nabi movement right so they they're now seeing themselves as prophets right we're this group of artists that have spent kind of our summers and winters off in Brittany right on the coast of, of the uh, Pacific Ocean or Atlantic Ocean uh, and you know we've been kind of isolated playing around in the forest making these paintings we're kind of like our own secret society like every time we come back to Paris you know we talk about this thing or that thing and the other people in the pub are like what are you talking about oh you, you had to be there it was oh man Paul had this crazy dream the other night and Maurice was like and people are like yeah I, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. And they're just like, yeah, I guess we are kind of our own little insular group. And then this, so this painting also travels through the group. And sometimes they would give it to one another as sort of like a, as this talisman, as this kind of fortune object that has, they felt kind of, I don't think they really believed it had any secret powers. Um, but it, um, I guess it just was kind of like a, a symbol of their friendship and their community. And, uh, so at first it resides in, um, let me see whose studio. Okay. So Paul, um, Ranson, and we're doing a Ranson painting maybe next month within like five or six weeks from now is another artist I love certainly an artist that is way underappreciated so we'll look at his work because I think his work is seems very modern and contemporary 
so for a, a while, that painting is in Ranson's studio. Ranson also starts up his own kind of school slash kind of, you know, like uh, a private art studio school, which Paul Serrazier later teaches at towards the end of his life. Uh, but so that painting kind of stays at Ranson's studio, uh, which also becomes sort of their meeting place. Let's see. So here it is, 25 Rue de Montparnasse. And maybe I'll just zoom back out here so you just have a context for... This is the city of Paris here. And, uh, so we see here in, in this Montparnasse neighborhood, this is kind of where they're all hanging out and meeting at Ranson's studio, kind of, they started having these sort of pseudo rituals. Uh, they saw them again, they kind of saw themselves as being kind of like a, as a guild or you know like the Freemasons and I don't, I don't know how seriously they took that whole thing I think they probably just got together and got drunk and maybe talked a lot about art argued about it but it was still kind of their own little boys club it was all men obviously uh and um and so they were also all painting paintings that had similar qualities, right? Had a lot of that uh, cloisonism, that that those flat colors surrounded by kind of maybe sometimes often dark outlines like Gauguin. Um, eventually that painting ends up in the hands of uh, Maurice Denis, who um, is kind of like the main historian and maybe even theorist of the Nabi, he's, uh, uh, Maurice Denis writes a, kind of a book, kind of collecting a lot of Nabi art and writings, mostly by him, to help kind of push the, the, the quote-unquote theory behind that, that group and movement. And so when Maurice Denis dies, uh, he gives a, a large portion of his work to the French state, the French government, and so now that's why this painting is in the collection of the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, probably the gr one of the great art museums of the world, but certainly the the best museum to see art by the Impressionists. Right, it's got a great collection of, of Impressionist and post-Impressionist work, like lots of Gauguin, Van Gogh paintings, Monet, etc or in the Musée d'Orsay, and I should say, well, I'm thinking about, I think right across the river is the Orangerie, which is a really great museum. Yeah, they're not going to... Uh, L'Orangerie, which also has a really great collection of um, of impressionist work but also is very famous for these gigantic two like spaceship themed or, or sized rooms that have these gigantic Monet paintings on the wall so whereas Monet and the Impressionists are really trying to paint what they see, and not like a photograph, but they're really trying to get the, like really the, how color is working and really highlighting color. So it's a very visual um, uh, movement. It's all about how the eye and brain perceive color and translating that into paintings, right? In post-Impressionism, is taking often some of the more bright colors that the Impressionist used, but then also blending it with the artist's personal interpretation of what they see and the emotions that the, the, that, that experience elicits, right? So 
it's it is kind of the also prefigures expressionism right so you think of van gogh as a, a perfect example of post-impressionism where you know he's painting colors and things that maybe are there but he's just dialing everything up to 10. Uh, I do want to just sort of look here a little bit more at Cerizier's work that he creates. Um, so you'll see in a lot of paintings by Les Nabi and, and also by Paul Gauguin, the particular sort of clothing that, that many of the women wore in Brittany um, that is very iconic, like these... You know, it, it almost has like a bit of a Quaker kind of quality to it. And so that's why I think also all these Parisian artists really liked spending time in Brittany. It kind of felt like it was a different world, right? Different cultures than they really experienced in, um, in central and maybe southern France. Uh, it really did feel like a different world and a world that had very different customs it was strange and i think that strangeness or what some people might call the fantastic is what the les nabi artists were were absolutely fascinated by right so the 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 fantastic as written by like various different philosophers would be that experience of of um, seeing something that appears recognizable, but you can't put your finger on it, right? It's, uh, you know, you, you almost feel like, I think I had a dream about this, and now I'm experiencing it. Like, what is the name of the, that, um, that feeling of... Oh, it's just on the tip of my tongue. But anyway, so so that's that feeling of going to Brittany and seeing landscapes, which are not too dissimilar from what you would see in in around Paris, but the people there and the way they interact with the landscape is very different. So it's that feeling of familiar and unfamiliar at the same time. The umheimlich, as uh, Sigmund Freud said. Cool. Was it coincidence? Not coincidence. It's the. Oh, drive me crazy. Some of you probably know exactly. Um... So, you know, again, like you have all these kind of these strange rituals happening in the forest. Now, are these are these things that the Les Nabi are inventing, or are these things that they see that you know these Breton people? are doing right are they witnessing kind of their own um uh, traditions and rituals and then just painting them as they see them or are they kind of adding their own mysterious mysticism on top of them i think these are beautiful paintings also again very strange and so if you look at any of this work and you're like these are really weird like, I don't, I'm not, I have no idea what's going on in any of these paintings. Then they're doing their job, right? They're, they're intended to be strange and weird and mysterious. I think that's also why another artist, um, oh, whose name, why am I having, uh, Peter Doig. <sighs> so here's uh, uh, Peter Doig is an artist originally born in Scotland but raised in Canada. Um, let's see. 
he's considered definitely to be one of the, the great living artists of our time. And you can really see how deeply indebted he is to art by people like Pierre Bonnard, Paul Cerisier, Gauguin, perhaps, to maybe a lesser extent. But these paintings that all have a weirdness to them, where you're like, the artist has created their own mythology, their own series of symbols that um, we may never even be able to to pull all apart. And the artists themselves might be kind of cagey about explaining what those um, <clears throat> uh, what those things actually mean. Right? And sometimes you might watch a movie and you're like, what is going on? I don't know. And, and the, the filmmaker would say, it's not my job to explain things. And then so then you have to go and you watch videos afterwards, like the ending of such and such movie explained. Right? Because, because the artist wants it to be deliberately ambiguous. <laughs> so uh, by about the mid... 1890s uh, and early 1900s, Cerisier starts to kind of move a little bit further and further away from the Les Nabis group. So the Les Nabis really only officially exist from about uh, 18, um, 1888 to about 1894, something around there. And then they kind of start drifting off into the, on their own. Uh, you know, they're still friends with one another, but uh, Cerisier starts to become more and more interested in um, things like theology and mysticism. And his own work starts to, he starts to, we looked at a number of artists, even Canadian artists. Theology was like a big movement in many of the members of the group of seven got into it. Uh, this idea that, you know, imbuing everything in a painting with some kind of spiritual element and that like every color, every brushstroke, every image is kind of, again, is a symbol for greater spiritual goals. Um... I think we'll wrap up here pretty soon. Other little quick things about Cerisier is he was married um, and he had a, a wife for many years, although she was, you know, in and out of um, mental institutions for much of the time they were together, which I think was very uh, traumatizing for, for the both of them. And so that that also left him kind of like yearning for for meaning I think yearning for some explanation as to why the world was the world that we have um, what what is un like there's gotta be some reason for all of this I think is what he's feeling and searching for throughout his work as he you know uh, grieves this this sad situation with his wife I think that also just makes him feel like there's there's a way to solve this there's behind the the world of of beautiful appearances there's something going on if I can break through that if I can tap into that maybe I can solve the the unhappiness in my life and the thing that ails my wife so you know towards the end of Cerisier's life and so he passes away in 1927 um, many people in fact we don't even really see a lot of his later work here um, you know tends to be there's a lot of these kind of like still lives there are um, He's kind of moving away from some of the the uh, more symbolic 
the symbolist image paintings of his past, and generally considered to be kind of his, his later work tends to be seen quite negatively compared to his early work. Um, which is sometimes not unusual. Often, like, artists towards the end of their lives start doing things that are very different than what they did when they were younger, and people become kind of, you know, they, they want to see the hits. You know, it's the same sort of things with bands like the Rolling Stones. Like, I'm going to go see the Rolling Stones in a few months, and, you know, the Rolling Stones just put out a new album. It's got some good songs on it. But do you think that the majority of people who are going to see that show want to hear them play only the new album? Probably not. Most of them want to hear songs that these guys who are now in their early 80s wrote when they were like 19, 20 years old. So you can imagine how difficult that is for an artist who's like, who's saying like, listen, I've, I've, I made all new music. I'm like in my early 80s. Do I really want to be singing the songs I wrote 60 years ago? Like, or, you know, um, it would be nice if people would want to hear my new stuff. I've kind of moved on. I'm a different person, right? How much, just think to yourself about how much you identify with the person that you were when you were in your teens and 20s, right? So I think a lot of artists find that kind of quite constricting, like, wanting to create something new and want people to embrace the thing that they're doing now when all people want to do is talk about the stuff they did in this case when Paul Cerisier was you know 23 24 25 uh, years old so um, yeah there's so many examples throughout art history where we could talk about another name comes off the top of my head would be Willem de Kooning we're gonna look at some Willem de Kooning paintings I think two months from now, we've, we've got a couple days of de Kooning paintings and Jackson Pollock and same sort of thing. Artists who whose early work was was uh, celebrated and then the later work was was outright rejected by sometimes the, their supporters and collectors. So anyway, I think we should move on. Maybe I'll... So, sometimes at this stage, I'll do a little bit of underpainting to get the artwork started. I mean, let's. I wasn't planning on doing anything here, but maybe let's just take a look at the painting, seeing if there is any need for underpainting. I don't really see line work here. I think this painting is very expressive, so. I think we should be able just to go right in and start painting it. So, in that case, let's go. Let's start here with our background. And so, there is space in this painting. There is a background and a middle ground and a foreground. Although you could be... Um, uh, you, you could easily look at this painting and, and just feel it looks like a, a totally abstract painting. But... This is technically, you know, this, there's like a, some sort of a river here and a kind of a river edge and these trees reflecting into the water. And maybe this is like a log or something floating in the water and this dark shadow, maybe on, from the other side of the river, or maybe that's the other shore. It's hard to tell. And again, artists like Cerisier and the Les Nabi, it's not about making something that looks photographic and, the, and it doesn't have to be necessarily coherent. The space, the space inside doesn't have to be illusionistic or possible. It can be slightly incoherent or impossible, right? Um, so... So I'm looking at this painting um, you know, and Pascal even says here in the chat, there is warm yellow underpainting, which is the imprematura anyways. Right, so we have this kind of orangey yellow underneath everything. And maybe I, I'm actually just going to zoom in here.
You know, I'm a little bit tempted. Okay, so I'm just trying. Do I want to do this painting as quickly and easily as possible? Or do I want to try to replicate the painting as faithfully as possible? Because I could just start going in here and start painting yellows and greens and blues, and we could be done this painting probably in about an hour. Or I could try to get a little bit closer to the other, and it might take me two hours. I think I'm just going to do a little, I'm going to try to get a little bit closer. So what I want to do is I'm going to try to mix a bit more of this orangey color, brownish orange, that goes on kind of underneath these colors. And I think probably, you know, he's painting on, well, he's painting on some sort of wood surface. And um, he's probably just primed it a little bit, maybe even used a bit of warm yellow. Actually, I've got some of those colors out there already, so. Let's take, I'm gonna take my warm yellow. Take some warm blue. Tiny bit of, sorry, bit of warm red and warm blue. Let's mix this together. Add some matte medium to this. So I'm just going to do a, a very minor modification. To my imprimatura. So I'm just adding this matte medium to make the color a little bit more transparent so that I'm not, so that some of that warm yellow that I've, I've painted with just stays there on the surface. Now, of course, I could have just done this in, in lieu of my aim prematura right at the beginning. Right, I could have just combined these two steps together. But for me, it's always, I, again, you know, maybe as a viewer at home, if you're just following these paintings and doing you know, like as this kind of recipe you could just jump to this but for me I'm trying to figure it out in real time so rather than sitting here spending the first 10 minutes of a painting trying to figure out what I should do I like just to get it started put some paint on there and then I feel like I'm in it you know I'm not waiting around for myself to make up a decision so that's good I think that's probably that makes me happy as a as a way to kind of get a little bit closer to the original Kathy's or uh Pascal says, try as Cerisier would have done it. <laughs> Kathy says, two hours, that probably means three, right? Pascal says, two hours from here, Kathy. <laughs> I think we already did two. <laughs> oh, goodness. 
Oh, when people know you too well. Oh. Oh, goodness. <laughs> oh, I bl make me blush. Goodman's back. Hi, Goodman. Okay, I'm going to quickly blow dry this. I'll just show you kind of maybe these paintings side by side at this moment. So you can see what I've just done is tried to mix this color there. Okay. Okay, it's still a little bit tacky in a few places because I kind of spread a lot of paint on there, but that's okay. It'll dry as we paint on it. Great question, Pascal says, is, are the colors cooler in the distance or background? If we turn it upside down, would we feel it's wrong? Well, that's a great question. That's a that's a really I like that, Pascal. That's a really interesting method for looking at paintings in the future. Brilliant. I love that. Well, let's uh, flip it around. You know, that's interesting because now hard to say like that I do feel like I don't think he's really used I mean he's got some of these these are definitely cool greens down here that's for sure but he's got those cool greens here these th this yellow seems both this seems cooler yellow up top than down here You know, you got this is a warm green here. This looks like a kind of a warmer purpley um, blue. I think all these blues are probably all ultramarine blue, even that. So you're you're right to point out, Pascal, that he's he's kind of breaking the the warm and cool color rules here of putting the warm colors in the foreground cool colors in the background um, i think that's one thing that adds to a, a kind of a flatness of this painting um, in which there's maybe less depth that we might see in an, an impressionist painting for instance so um and I'm sure that that Sorizier was doing this deliberately, uh, to, that to to put your to kind of have the same color temperatures throughout the painting, um, kind of negates the depth that would ordinarily be painted. So, for instance, if we were to paint this painting as we normally do, with cool colors exclusively in the background and warm colors exclusively in the foreground. We would this painting would appear to have a lot more depth. It would it would look more like a recognizable space. But the fact that the colors are not being applied in that with that 
concept in mind of putting the warm colors in the foreground, cool colors in the background, it flattens the painting and creates a much more ambiguous space that for some people just looks totally abstract. And I bet you that was something probably Gauguin and Cerisier talked about when they're walking through this space is like, you know, how can, how can I paint this painting, use many of the colors that are in this scene that we see in front of us, but also create something that appears simultaneously unrecognizable, right? That's a, it's a, it's a really bizarre thing to think about, but how can we take the familiar and make it unfamiliar, right? That's a, uh, um, that's an interesting challenge there. So I think I'm going to paint it kind of like wh what we see here, rather than necessarily trying to get, you know, warm and cool colors to work as we've done throughout many, many artworks before. Because I'm, I'm sure Cerisier would have learned all of the, the rules, or the so-called rules of, of color temperature that we've spent a long time talking about. But here I think he's trying to to play with them or or completely overturn them i would say yeah and you, i can see like pascal says oh i see it that this blue house back here and senga says i see the yellow tree looks like a skull right yeah there's definitely all sorts of weird things in here that we might start to see for sure Right. Okay, which I think is what gives it that enigmatic quality, which is why the other Nabi saw this painting as sort of they called it the talisman, as the as that's this enigmatic object that may have some sort of hidden powers that could be evoked through some kind of ceremony or ritual. Right. Very interesting. Goodman says I can't. Uh, shape anything honestly all I see is colors and weird curved shapes <laughs> that's totally fine too right okay so let's talk more paint let's um, let's bring these up side by side here so let, I, I will start out the way I typically do with some um, uh, with cooler colors so let's take our cool yellow. Let's take a bit of cool blue in here. And I'm gonna apply like some glazing fluid in here to make the color a little bit more transparent. So I'm gonna have some areas where the colors a little bit, maybe that's, well, you know what? I think actually that's fine. It, this is very transparent though. So let's actually, let's take a bit more paint. Hmm, maybe I didn't need any medium at all after all. So I'm actually going to take just a dab of white to counteract the medium.
so I think that's probably not even showing up on camera. It doesn't appear to be anyway. I can assure you I'm painting stuff. <laughs> uh... So basically I'm painting all of the areas that are green with this semi-transparent green. Can you really not see those colors? It looks, you know, on for me, I can see that perfectly fine, but on camera, it almost disappears entirely. <coughs> Lisa says, I see reflection, but what is the gray object? What is the gray object? I'm not sure I know. You're talking about this kind of thing down here? These things, or? I'm not sure. I mean, again, a big part of, of this work and of work by these artists is ambiguity. Is, is creating a sense of mystery, strangeness, of uncanny... Um, of having that that sense of having seen it before a little bit. You know, I think they're probably standing on the like this is they're probably walking along a shore which walks along the river like this. And this is I think is the main river area. Is this a this big dark shape, is that a reflection of trees in the water, or is that a sh um, the shoreline? Who knows? Okay. Uh, let's take... I'm going to take this same yellow... I'm going to add some white in here. Now, I don't think there is white in his yellow. I'm just painting this in order to help make it pop a little bit off of this background.
or anything. Like that. Almost got managed to get that cough out before I muted it, but didn't succeed. Okay. So I think I'm going to blow dry all of that really quickly so that I can paint over top of it all. take my cool yellow and cool blue and kind of go over some of these areas. side of my brush there to kind of carve into this So I began by putting that a semi-transparent green that had just a little bit of white in it. And that allowed me to now paint this more saturated, cool green over top of it in a way that, that it's going to show up better on this brown. So while it might not be super visible on camera, it has made quite a big difference here in the color that I'm able to paint. Yellow with a little bit of 
green in it. I think he painted this under here too, but it looks like he might have darkened over top of it. Now that that green has started to dry, I'm just taking a bit more of it here. I'm just going to paint back over some areas. little dashes that's some of the same thing but with a green that's got a lot of white in it yellow there. I like how this is turning out. It's it's you know I'm kind of going a little bit slow. Um, another thing with the way that Cerisier painted is he often would start a painting on location and then continue and finish it at home, which is not unusual. I mean, a lot of artists, impressionist painters, did that. Canadian group of seven painters painted like that. Um, very common, but the I, but I think what they were trying to do. Um, like so most of the time artists would do that in the past just out of necessity right you would start on location and then it, you could be painting for five six ten twenty hours and obviously it's not feasible just to be sitting outside for that long the lights changing the weather's changing I think the way that Les Nabis 
um, proceeded though was to go outside, start the painting, and kind of get maybe the composition in place, and then deliberately maybe maybe it was still beautiful outside. The colors are great, but go go somewhere else to finish it so that the, your imagination fills in the missing spaces in order to almost deliberately prevent the, the possibility of the painting being naturalistic or representational that that by removing yourself from the original context you you have no choice but to use your imagination to fill in the blanks and so while many which would be kind of contradictory to the way a lot of other artists painted and like wanting to get as close to the original scene as possible like that's what Monet's trying to do he's not trying to make it look like a photograph he's trying to get the color exact right he's very focused on that whereas Les Nabi, it's like I kind of what can I do to complicate the situation for myself so that I have no choice but to rely on my memory or my the way that I felt about that moment of um to complete it. <laughs> I see all these funny things what people see in here. Senga says, I see another face with elephant nose and frog's legs coming out of the ear. Things as I see loads of faces, heads, and shapes now. Pascal says the translation of the title is odd. In French, it says Le Bois d'Amour. So the original title of this painting, yes, you're right, is um, Le Bois d'Amour, or the, the the love forest, perhaps, right, or the forest of love. <laughs> Uh, that was the title that Sorizier gave to the painting. But when he brought it back to his friends and showed it to them, they were the ones... Um, I'm trying to think, was it... Who... Um, one of his friends is like... That's when... I think it was Ranson said, this is the talisman. This is our... The painting that is our way forward. This is like the primal object for our movement. This is what we should be trying to do. So, kind of its unofficial title is The Talisman, but in, in its real original title is Le Bois d'Amour à Pont Avant. Um, I don't think... it's, And so, I don't know if Cerisier ever uh, called it The Talisman himself. It's just the, the name of the painting as it's come to be known by. And certainly, it's much more famously known as the Talisman, not by its original title. So, I don't think, it's not a translation issue here. It's 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 the disconnect between Cerizier's original title for the piece and then the name that the, you know, it's like, there's, there's lots of paintings throughout art history who have sort of two names. The, the title that it was originally titled. In fact, a lot of paintings, sometimes artists would just leave untitled. Like we've looked at a number of artists like Tom Thompson and the Group of Seven. Well, Tom Thompson died before most of his paintings could even be titled. So th th a lot of those titles were given after he had, had died. right? So sometimes titles are created by collectors, curators, historians, critics, um, and yeah, so, because sometimes, like, even myself, like, I've come up with paintings and shown up to an art gallery with a whole bunch of stuff, and, you know, the, and without any, and we often, like, when we start hanging them, the curator would be like, so, you got names for this stuff? We got any titles for me? And, and, <clears throat> Sometimes I've just got, like, a whole list of fun titles that have come up. Sometimes you work on a painting and you know, like, oh, this is... I know what this is going to be called. And then sometimes you know, I have no idea. And then I... So I've literally said, like, I don't know. What do you think? What would be a good title? And sometimes it's fun to hear what somebody else might suggest as a title for your work. And sometimes they come up with a bunch of... Yeah, I don't know about that one. 
where you're like, that's great. I love, I would never have seen. So, I mean, I'm sure probably Cerizier, you know, he was alive when his friends were calling it the talisman. And so he might have, who knows how he felt about that. He might have been like, guys, stop calling it that. Oh, I hate that title. Ugh. Or he might have been like, that's kind of cool. It's kind of flattering that you guys see this painting as the talisman for our kind of small community of artists. Pascal says, oh wow, so the title is symbolic as well. Absolutely. <laughs> they did that in Doctor Who as well. What what do you mean they did that in Doctor Who? Have several different titles? Goodman says, is there a description on every painting about the reasons and way the shapes they chose for it? <clears throat> on the Facebook group, I do um, spend probably more time than I should writing up these these uh, little descriptions about each artwork. <clears throat> so you'll see there's kind of st stuff that I often cover when I'm talking about the biography of the artist, but this is, you know, just something to, you know, to help me put my own thoughts in order before I just start uh, the episode. Helps consolidate all the research I've done into kind of one space. So you're certainly welcome to read that before the episode or read it now if you like. I mean, I'll zoom in a little bit on there. I don't think there's anything different than what um, I mentioned so far, though. Anyway, let's get back to painting here. Just checking to see how that's dry. Uh, maybe I should do... Let's move to a different title here. Let's do... Now that we've got some of these greens in both the foreground and background, let's um, let's add a different set of colors here. Let's maybe go to our oranges, blues, and reds and stuff, right? And then we'll come back. So th these distinctions between foreground and background are a little bit less uh, helpful in a painting like this because this painting is really blurring the boundaries between foreground and background and areas that might seem like traditional backgrounds in this painting could be foreground areas. Okay, so let's put these side by side and let's, uh, let's pick out our blues now. Now maybe I will start with a little bit of cool blue and some white. I'm going to put a bit of warm blue in here as well because I think he's probably painting with a combination of, of cobalt blue which kind of is exists in between here in between our warm and cool and then probably using ultramarine blue in a few places just on its own <coughs> And here, I want to try to to resist the urge to completely block in or get rid of the colors or the sort of the imprimatura. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. You'll notice almost all my brush strokes are very uh, vertical. So I think that's kind of what he's doing here as well. Just a lot of vertical brush strokes. Just a little 
house back there. Now, I think that he's using a bit of a lighter blue. Well, he is definitely using a lighter blue than I'm doing. I'm just putting a few of these there. I think that's probably good enough. Let's take more white. than I was planning here. Take a bit of that off. Just adding a bit more warm blue. So it's, it requires some, um, it's hard to resist the urge just to paint everything in into like a solid shape. Kind of want to leave some gaps. Actually, I like the as the way that I wiped that paint off here has worked quite well. I like that. In fact, I might do a bit more of that there. So wiping paint off a picture is actually very common when you're painting with oil paints. Oil. When I was painting with oil paints, I did this kind of thing all the time. It's kind of a, a, a very common oil painter's technique to apply paint and then to remove a bit of it. I just wiped off a bit more than I should have there. But. So that's, you know, I, I'm kind of digging how that looks. I'm digging it. Farther. 
Well, sometimes you don't know where the line is until you cross it, right? So, that's okay. Um, but I will, instead of putting that color back on, I think what I did learn is that I wanted the color to be a bit more transparent. So I'm just going to take my glazing fluid and get this paint that's on, existing on my brush as it is. Like already, that kind of bit of ooh, uh, that effect, I think, has is works really well. It just creates kind of a that semi-transparent qualities. Kind of a bit unusual. Just my ultramarine blue. This ultramarine blue into these trees. I think he's using a bit of a, a bit more of a Prussian blue here, which we'll get to. There's no hurt in putting that in right there. And speaking of this blue, let's take a bit of warm yellow and warm blue. Get a bit more warm yellow here. So here's a different green altogether. Here's our warm green. Now I guess it needs more blue. So there's some darker, there's colors underneath some of these areas. And so I just want to try to build that up. Because remember, you know, Cersei is painting this painting, maybe starting from life and then finishing it later. And so he has to figure it all out. He doesn't have the, the advantage we have of being able to see the final version of this. And...
Maybe I should do this red. I think this looks like a cool red. Mostly cool red, just to give it, it's got this kind of, almost like a dried blood quality, oops, right here. What? There's lots of big conversation in here. Uh, Goodman says, I love and appreciate it much, but I mean on the original painting, when you search or find it in some websites. What was the question? Oh, is there a description on every painting about the reasons and... Uh, yeah, you have to... That's what I try to do. I find... As, I spend as much time as possible doing some research on all these artworks and try to share that with you guys. So yeah, you gotta do a little bit of digging. There's no one place where all that information is uh, held. Um, sometimes artists are happy to share all of the ideas behind their work. And then sometimes a lot of other artists are very secretive about their methods and concepts and ideas. And there's different beliefs on that. Some artists say, you know, it's up to the audience to make sense of it and to, I want to make, you know, give everyone an opportunity to interpret it for themselves. And there's some artists that are like, no, this is what it means. And I want people to know what it means. And I'm, I'm going to write text about it. I'm going to talk about it. Um, so everyone's a little bit different, you know, it's the same sort of thing. Like you might go to your friend's house and they make a really cool dinner. And you're like, this is delicious. Mm. What, what did you, how did you make this banana bread? I've never tasted banana bread. And they're not like, like this. And you're like, and they might say, it's, well, it's a secret recipe, family recipe. I don't, I, I don't really want to share it with anybody. And you're like, really? That's so good. I want to make some more at home. That's uh, just the way cookie crumbles, right? And some people are like, oh yeah, here, I'll give you the recipe. I'll share it with you. Different people have different, uh, different ideas about that right okay so let's take our I'm gonna take our warm yellow a bit of warm red and make a warm orange
Let's take this orange. I know that this area here is going to be red soon, but I'm going to paint it orange so that that red can really pop. Okay, so you can see I added a little, just little bits of this orange, almost with a, basically a dry brush, right? Meaning there's barely any paint coming off my brush. And then I'm just sort of just adding little bits of that paint in a few places. I'm going to quickly blow dry this whole thing. Okay, um, I want to put a bit more of this purple color in here, this cool red and cool blue.
So I'm mixing color that's almost black, but it's it's a little bit more on the like a cool brown side of things. I'm just going to mix the same color with just a bit of this green so it's not quite as dark. Take the same dark color. You see, I'll just I'm going to take the same color, just add some uh, cool yellow and a little bit more cool blue to it to get this kind of very dark green.
How did I miss this here? Okay, I'm just gonna blow dry all that. warm yellow and mix this into some of these darker colors. Okay, I think I want to go back in the other direction now to take my cool yellow.
me take a bunch. Let's take some white here. So let's, I'm gonna, actually, let's blow dry that real quick. Okay, let's get, let's take just our pure warm yellow. Or so this is cool yellow, my apologies. So I might go back over this yellow a few more times just to keep brightening it again and again and again. Without using white in there. Because the, there was white underneath there.
okay, we're making great progress. I mean, there's not a lot more to do. I just I do want to just sort of tweak the colors to get a little bit closer to the original. That means maybe darkening a few of these shapes on the right, brightening up a few things. Um, so let's go back to the background up here. And... Maybe even zoom in a little bit here. <laughs> so I think up in the top here, Get a bit more yellow. So I'm going to take some cool yellow and warm yellow and kind of make a little mixture of the two of them because I think that's. I see this top part is being a little bit warmer. Gonna blow dry. Well, you know, maybe it's gonna apply as much of this paint as possible. Well. You know, there is this kind of scratch. Maybe while we're all zoomed in here. Let's take just our pure uh, warm blue. Do we see this ultramarine blue elsewhere on its own? So I'm going to darken that again, but I'm going to come, oops, got some yellow on there, so. uh, in fact, let's 
area near the bottom down here. So let's take our white, a little bit of warm blue here. It's a bit of cool blue in there as well. So I'm just trying to paint wet into wet to try to get a little bit of those streaks happening. So we can see very plainly that those are brush strokes there. Uh, so this area is kind of a little bit of, the, of gray. So I'm gonna mix this again. I'm gonna take my cool blue, cool yeah, or red, and a little bit of cool yellow to get this kind of coolish gray. I'm gonna add glazing fluid here just to make it more transparent so that I don't obliterate everything that was there.
That's blue train, huh?
Ah, I realized I've been muted for a little bit there. I don't think I was saying anything particularly insightful. Then, or arguably ever. I know all this seems kind of, you know, unnecessary kind of little fiddling and stuff, and I could have finished earlier, but a big part of like a painting like this is just the subtle little differences, the, the areas where we could look at it for a while and see different things over and over and over again. You know, that's what gives us that, that effect where we look at it, we might see faces and things in there, so... Trying to nailing some of these uh, these little areas, I think, is really important. So, Okay, and I'm going to take my warm red, pure warm red.
watching underneath the covers. I love it. I love it. I love helping people fall asleep. <laughs> okay, I'm going to blow dry this here. So we're just about done. I just got a few last brush strokes, which may be some of the most important brush strokes, but I'm saving them to the last. Some of these, the bright uh, blue trees and this white that's sort of popping right in kind of the center right. And then I think that's gonna bring the whole painting together, hopefully, right? So let's see, let's see how this progresses at this stage here. Okay, so there's where that's mine, and then there's the other to the side. So let's um, let's maybe start with some of this bright white. Blow dry that. Goodness says, your painting is nicer than the originals. The colors and shapes. Wow, that's so sweet. Kathy says, I'm still painting, but I can't follow Michael anymore. I'm too slow. Um, I mean, I could see some people painting this painting faster in a slightly different way than me, taking a little bit longer. I think this is a... Actually, I really enjoy painting this painting because it's... It feels like there's a lot of room to play here, and... I could go pretty far from the original and still kind of keep the spirit of it. It might mean that the the some of the ideas behind it might have lost, you know, the symbols might have lost their original meaning. But then it just becomes something else. And that can be a great thing, a wonderful thing. So I'm going to blow and try that again. I really want that white to be just super intense.
I might need to do a little bit more of that, but let's uh, let's move on. <clears throat> we'll see. We'll see very shortly. Uh, so that blue. Again, I think it's like a, a combination of warm and cool blue. I'm gonna add just a little bit of glazing fluid to make it kind of glide over the surface a little bit easier. So, you know, this is very strange that this, I mean, it looks like it's this shadow or re this reflection, but it's going in a kind of a different angle here.
there's just a little bit of white. So I, I was trying to fix that, and I realized, oh, actually, there's maybe those colors actually cross over. Maybe it has to go the other way. It has to be. So, you, probably, you know, on camera, this looks actually kind of bright, but in person, it's pretty dark. In, in person, this looks like a really dark, solid shape that's kind of hard to distinguish as to maybe what exactly is going on there. So, I'm not going to leave it again. So, that's one of those little differences between what we see on camera versus what we can perceive in person. Ah, you know, the more the more you look at it, the more you just start seeing little things here and there that you want to add or change. That's the the curse of a painting in some way.
Okay, I think that's probably good enough. Now we've arrived at the end of our painting session. Let's compare these two paintings side by side and see how they turned out. Of course, just before we do that, just a quick friendly reminder to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you know when future videos are coming up. Uh, I do occasionally do kind of spontaneous live stream so if you want to be the first to know when those are happening or when the future live streams are going to come on then subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can be notified when you're in the youtube app it makes a huge difference to someone like myself doesn't cost you a penny but if you want to support the channel with a small donation you could use paypal you could use an e-transfer or or contact me for my e or for my address if you want to send something in the mail uh, you can use youtube super chat but youtube takes like 40% of whatever you donate. So PayPal or e-transfers are probably your best bet. My email and all that information, all that to find all that is on uh, the Facebook group or my website. Those links are down below. Da -da 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 -da. So here's the original. And then there's my version next to it. So, um, I like how this turned out, you know, his has, you know, there's the sort of like dirty texture or something that, uh, he's got here that I don't have in mind. Uh, and I was debating how much I want to simulate that effect. I think that's probably a little bit of using the rag to wash or wipe away some paints, um, which is hard to do in acrylic, much easier to do in uh, oil. Again, the painting itself is, uh, my painting is darker than the original. I mean, you can see in my hand there, we don't really see any real strong shadows, even though there are some darker areas on my hand. So this area, it's not black, but it is much closer to what we see in the original. Um, I think, I, I mean, I could probably in some areas have gone even darker perhaps, but I kind of like how that looks. Uh, let's take a look, let's zoom in. And maybe let's just start in bottom left corner here. Got a drop of water on there. It started to kind of eat away. Hmm, do I want to fix that or can I live with it? I think I can live with that. Okay, so some of these colors, you know, I, I think I got pretty close. I think he's layering lots of layers and wiping paint away, so matching those colors is kind of tricky. You know, this color that I've got here, which is kind of that, this minty toothpaste, is a little bit different. His has got a bit more uh, of a greenish quality, whereas mine's got a bit more of a teal kind of quality. Uh, but, you know, when I was mixing that, I kind of just liked it. And I was like, you know what, I want to use that color in here. I like that. Uh, yeah, let's go to the other side. I think some people were saying this might be a waterfall. But possibly. It could just be the reflection of the sun or something in the water. I'm not sure. Uh, to paint this, I used, I, was pa I painted sort of a lighter blue. Or maybe it was a, I think it was a lighter blue, and then I kind of gently went on top of it with a darker blue while it was still wet, just to kind of get 
the streaks to kind of occur there a little bit. I mean, you could see things like some of the stuff on the far right of the picture um, could be darker, like basically a dark brown over top of this. But I just sort of left it kind of like that. Um, just so I could bring some attention back into this area. So that our focus isn't entirely on the center of the painting. Let's go top right. You know, as I look at his painting, I, it looks like he actually scraped in there three times. It's almost like a, a fork or something. I just did two lines with the back side of my paintbrush. You know, I just sometimes flip the brush around and then just, if you got wet paint, you can just draw right into that wet paint. So, um, as I, the more I look at it, I'm like, oh, I see not just those two, but there's a third one there fourth one there. Um, you know, the way that I did the house, I ended up just putting a dark blue line there, even though it's not really there. Uh, his was just layering of green over the blue, which created that slight darker. I just, just for the sake of simplicity, just went and threw a line in there. And then let's go top left. Feel pretty good with all that. Like, again, I love how kind of dirty and scuffed up this whole area is. Very hard to recreate in acrylic. Um, I suspect part of that is just like dust and dirt in the varnish. Probably if we were to clean it, we might see less of that. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to mostly stay with the, the paint and rather than trying to kind of uh, create all of these, you know, like a fake the patina kind of thing here. Okay, and then all these tree branches. You know, he almost did them all in one quick little brush stroke. There's very little, you know, you can see he even went back and tried to, you know, and continued these lines, but they're not perfect. They're not neatly overlapping. We can even actually see how they overlap, which is is really interesting to think about. Like he's, you know, not trying to kind of make it look like, oh, I did one perfect line the first time. Which I kind of tried to do. I kind of want to make it look like, oh, look look how good I am at drawing nice, solid lines. And mine kind of, in that way, ends up looking sloppy, whereas his looks more expressive. So, very interesting painting. So if you ever find yourself in Paris at the Musée d'Orsay, you can go and try and track this little one down. Uh, you might miss it if you're running through that museum quickly. So it's a very small painting, probably about this size. So I've actually enlarged the original here. Okay, so that brings us to the end of another session here. And um, I can't remember what's next week, but we've got a, a bunch of things coming up for Easter. So I'm looking forward to tackling a bunch of Easter paintings. It's nice to also do, oh, I think it's Courbet next week. That's going to be a fun one. Courbet is an interesting figure for sure. Okay, well, thanks, everybody. Thanks for helping make this world a more beautiful place because every time you pick up a paintbrush or a violin or write a little poem or do a dance, you're introducing beauty into the world, and boy, do we need a little bit more 
beauty in this world. And I think if everyone had some sort of creative outlet, like making art, we would live in a lot more peaceful place as well. So by making art, you're spreading the joy of art and culture throughout the universe. And little by little, those little flaps of butter wings have an effect. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you again next week. Take care. Have a great night. Ah, and there's Paula at the very end. Good night, everybody.